talking this week about error focus, which may sound like a strange principle, but, but this is the, the fourth criterion um, of the four we've been talking about initially, uh, and ways you can spot the middle way when you see it. Um, and um, yeah, so the focus on error, I suppose the, the uh, perspective this comes from really is uh, the idea that we make gradual process, gradual progress uh, by making mistakes. Um, so, uh, I mean, it may seem at the, at the outset, you know, thinking about error as a negative emphasis, but actually uh, it doesn't have to be an emotionally negative emphasis. Uh, it's just a realistic facing up to, I suppose, the, um, the limitations of our understanding of things, the degree of uncertainty we have as human beings. Um, and that uh, what that implies is that we learn bit by bit and we learn through a process of mistake, making mistakes and rectifying them. Um, and um, the, the, the general approach um, that I'm using here in the middle way owes, owes quite a lot to Karl Popper and his approach to the scientific method, which was a, has been an inspiration to me, uh, his, his philosophy of science. Um, and he was the one who first pointed out that um, science can make, uh, most crucially makes advances uh, by recognizing what's false or what at least should be rejected, maybe not absolutely false, but what is clearly worthy of not believing um, as opposed to what we definitely should believe. Um, so he called that falsification. Um, and you can see that in the example, say, of the famous example of the white and black swans. So uh, every time you encounter a white swan, you can say, oh, well, this is a confirmation of my belief that all swans are white. And you meet another white swan and you think, oh, I know this, this is definitely true. Um, but then, of course, one day you may meet a black swan and then you'll have to reconsider what you thought. So actually, you've learned a lot more by meeting a black swan than you did by meeting white swans. Um, the black swan has told you that your belief about all swans being white is wrong or at least no longer justifiable. Um, <clears throat> whereas each new confirmation you got just gave you a bit more confidence that swans are white, but it didn't really give you anything more than that. Um, so in a similar way, I think, if you're thinking about our individual progress, uh, each recognition of error as we're practicing the middle way <clears throat> can gradually help to integrate habits of judgment um, by making us aware of a little bit more beyond the set of assumptions we might have been making <clears throat> up to that point. Um, so yeah, you can see it as part of a, of a longer process. Um, but also um, the focus on error is due to the, the limitations of the positive values that we may believe in. So, so now I don't want to um, disrespect positive values at all. I do think we all have them. Um, but they inspire us and they're, they're our starting point. Yeah. So to give you some examples, um, a lot of people I would expect in this group have more or less left-wing political uh, ideals which probably means that they're going to really value social justice and care. Uh, so they're going to value um, paying attention to the needs of the poor, uh, avoiding disadvantage, increasing equality, uh, and caring for people who are in need. Um, so those are important values, justice and care. Um, and that can inspire a socialist, say, or left-wing kind of uh, political ideology or some other things that maybe might inspire people might be uh, nature and the value of the earth uh, or the idea of awakening or spirituality in buddhism or in other religions um, or maybe the middle way itself might inspire you as a, as a positive value so all of those values help to inspire us um, and guide us in our judgments but <clears throat> the trouble is that just taken by themselves those values are a bit of a blunt instrument. Um, 
So if we take them as how we should generally judge things, we should always um, try and improve justice and care, for example, that can start getting rigidified. Um, it can do that in, in various ways. So, so it can become rigidified by um, in-group, out-group assumptions, for example. So you might have a group of people who really believe in social justice, say, and that means that you uh, make false assumptions or very sweeping assumptions about people who don't share those values. Uh, so in the case of uh, left-wing views, that would be probably the Tories. Um, but obviously Tories are a complex group with all sorts of different motivations and um, you know, it's, it's a tradition in itself. Um, then um, we can also absolutize one value at the expense of others, but you know, there are various sorts of values that everybody has to some degree that um, play a part in our lives. Uh, and these have been um, investigated by the social psychologist, Jonathan Haidt, um, who talks about uh, six values that, that everybody has to some degree. So, so justice, care, freedom, loyalty, authority, and purity. Um, so, you know, for example, we, you could believe in freedom um, and um, want to make sure that everybody is free, but, but that will, uh, every time you're free, perhaps that might restrict the freedom of somebody else or justice for somebody else. Um, so, so there are always trade-offs and um, whenever you use one particular value, it tends to impact on the other ones. Um, so, so for example, the freedom to wear cheap clothes uh, in the West may mean um, poverty wages for somebody in Bangladesh. Um, then the, um, there's another point is that our positive ideals don't by themselves help us to make better judgments. Um, so uh, just having an ideal might tell you what you're aiming for, but not how best to bring about those goals. You know, so if your aim is social justice, for example, how do you actually improve things so that things get more just? Um, that requires a bit more subtlety and awareness of other values and how they impact on us so as to actually realistically make that happen. Um, so in order to, in practice, realize a lot of ideals, we have to be able to look beyond uh, what they might seem to be telling us quite often. We can't justify unconditional commitment to our, our positive values or, or just deduce our beliefs from them. Um, but that is the traditional way that ideologies, political or religious or otherwise, tend to work. So they tell us that um, we should believe in a certain sort of value maybe in religious terms, God's will, um, and we should follow what God's will tells us. Um, but uh, you know, that doesn't tell us uh, how to deal with the complexities of the biases and feelings that we might encounter and actually try to put that into action, whatever we believe it to be. Um, so rather than just relying on positive values, I think we need to uh, think in terms of errors instead as an alternative, just because our errors are easier to identify. Um, so errors here doesn't just mean, it doesn't mean um, kind of sins or, or just um, you know, breaking particular rules. It's more um, in middle way terms, when we, uh, we make a judgment, and we make a, we absolutize as we make that judgment. Um, so in the specific context, in the specific context where we're making our judgment, uh, we can identify an error when we have uh, made an absolute sort of judgment in that judgment, in that situation. Um, now that as an approach doesn't depend on the content of the judgment. It doesn't depend on what you're judging. It doesn't depend on the what. It's just about the how, the how we judge. Um, so it still works, whatever your positive values are, um, whatever your politics or your religious tradition are, for instance. Um, but of course, 
there's still a question of how do we identify an error in this sense. Um, and um, a kind of um, brief way perhaps of um, recalling it or thinking about it might be the um, term used by Wordsworth, I think it was, um, recollection in tranquility. So the idea we, we, we might go through a sort of panicked judgment of some kind or some other sort of experience where we're subject to um, anxiety or craving or something like that. Um, but maybe a bit later we think, oh, well, maybe I could have judged that a bit better. You know, maybe there was a problem there. Um, so we can't really um, usually expect ourselves to, to catch ourselves in the heat of the moment. But each time we recall in tranquility that we made a mistake, um, then we slightly change our understanding of what we're doing and slightly increase the odds of, of remembering in time next time around. Um, so um, the kind of uh, absolutization we might make in the course of a judgment involves getting caught up in some sort of closed loop. Uh, so uh, a reinforcing feedback loop um, where our assumptions uh, build up our view of things and that goes back to feed our assumptions. So we carry on in the same set of assumptions all the time uh, with our emotions attached to that uh, set of assumptions to an increasing extent. And we, we can catch ourselves doing that in, in several sorts of ways. It could be uh, we could be keeping an eye on our emotional state or we could be thinking more in terms of our thinking or our reasoning. Um, so emotional states, well, anxiety and obsession are the obvious ones to, to look out for um, as the, uh, the kinds of emotion that tend to loop us, loop us in loops. Um, so we could realize, oh, I got a bit anxious at that point um, and didn't judge that so well. Or you can look out for fallacies. Um, so fallacies, I think, are, are mainly kind of um, breaches of conventions in argument. So when we're, when we're discussing something, particularly if we disagree with someone else, and we're trying to give them reasons to believe something, but uh, we do so in a way that tries to take a shortcut rather than going through what the other person needs to consider to change their view. So an ad hominem attack is an example of that. You know, so it's, if instead of explaining to somebody um, what the reasons are for, for why you think differently from them, you say, oh, well, you're not qualified to, to say anything about that, you know, or, or you're, uh, you would say that, wouldn't you? You're just a Tory or whatever. Then that's um, an example of a, an attempted shortcut. And we might catch ourselves having done that and think, well, actually, I could have done that better. Um, or you can think in terms of, of bias, and again, there are a lot of biases identified by cognitive psychology that um, can help us to, to alert us to ways that we might get caught up in loops. Um, so just an example of that, if you assume that if somebody does something disadvantageous to you and they must be totally responsible for it, uh, that's an example of a responsibility bias. So, so supposing somebody cuts in uh, on you in the traffic, um, somebody does a risky manoeuvre and you assume immediately they did it deliberately and reflectively, they're responsible for it, but of course there could be a whole variety of reasons why they did that, they were distracted by their small child in the back or something like that. Um, so, so there are various ways we can find errors, um, ways we can prompt ourselves to become aware of things we could have improved. And that I think is central to the practice of the middle way. In fact, if, if you think in meditation practice particularly, I think that that works in the same way that you, you catch yourself being distracted and then you're a bit more concentrated. It's not that you go straight to concentration and stay there, it's that you gradually work with your distraction. Um, so obviously those methods of working with error are not infallible uh, but I think they are much more reliable, generally, than positive um, ideals because basically they're focused on a much more limited workable zone, that is our judgment, what we're doing. Um, and despite the difficulties of doing that, which are considerable, 
it's a lot easier to work a bit with our judgments and make some progress with it than perhaps to, to change everything else in the world on the basis of assumptions about everything in the world. Um, so absolute claims about true values in the whole universe, you know, that's obviously a big uh, deal to, to rely on. Um, so, so basically each recognition of error that we make uh, can, can aid uh, an overall integration process, uh, changing the psychological conditions of our judgment. Um, and that's what enables uh, genuine progress of the middle way, um, which brings our ideals into contact with the conditions around us. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, and open up to questions. So um, hopefully you should be able to unmute yourself if you want to ask anything or comment in any way. Hi, Robert, I can't find the put your hand up thing on, on my, is it okay if I ask? Of course, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, from, from what I remember when I was reading the Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman and the other person, um, he's, he said there wasn't, I mean, the book was all about uh, fallacies and, and so on, if, if you haven't read it. Um, it. But his point seemed to be that we're absolutely hopeless at spotting our own mistakes and that we've, there's only really a when you bring, but we're, we're quite good at spotting mistakes in others. So, I mean, what, what, what role do you think there is for, for like bringing in other people um, as a way of, <laughs> yeah. of spotting error or, or dealing with error? Obviously a very important one. Yes. That's something I should really have mentioned. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's where the obvious <coughs> um, great advantage of friendship comes in. That, that if you know somebody well enough um, who is confident enough to challenge you in a, in a uh, sustainable way, yeah, so rather than entering some sort of um, challenge for the sake of it or to score a point or whatever, but is actually interested in helping you to develop, um, if, they, if they can challenge you, then that's a great way of getting a reflection on yourself. Um, and certainly I feel privileged to have that, say, say in my relationship with my wife, because we challenge each other all the time and we have that kind of view and we still love each other, you know, so that's not a, an issue. I'm, I expect a lot of you have those kind of relationships too. So, um, and, um, and of course that's also what can happen in the context of things like uh, retreats where maybe you, you spend time with people you know a bit less well, but again, you maybe get to that point of, of communication where you can look more deeply at your assumptions uh, as, as they're reflected back at you by others. Um, but obviously it has to be done, done carefully. You do need to know the other person well, <coughs> hopefully, uh, in order to be able to do that well. Can I ask something, Robert? Yeah. Um, so I'm still trying to grapple with the middle way generally, so I hope you don't mind a general question. Sure. So if you take something like the climate crisis, um, if I was to try to apply the middle way, there'd be, I've got two, I've got, I guess, two questions in this. At what level does one apply the middle way? And, um, and I'm sure it's context specific, but also at one, at what stage um, are absolutes okay? So, so for instance, so on climate, change and global warming, the science is, you know, 97, 98% um, says that it exists. So there doesn't seem to be a particular role for the middle way, or that's my question. Is there a role for the middle way in, in situations like that? And then my second question, if you don't mind, is when I say at what level do you apply the middle way? So let's say that you say, well, science science defines that and you don't apply the middle way to whether climate change exists or not. But perhaps in our response to it, we need to be measured um, in order to bring everyone on side and um, moderate our views in some way in, in doing something about it. 
arguably. Um, but then you could also make the argument that, you know, actually only rather extreme action like Extinction Rebellion or, um, you know, activism is necessary. So I just taking that as a gigantic issue, obviously, I'm just curious yeah. how yeah. one could apply the middle way. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I agree with you that you need the middle way in interpreting the science, but I think you also need the middle way in doing the science. Um, so um, and if something is 98% justified, um, then the, the middle way is fine, involves finding that um, degree of probability and working with it confidently, I think. So, so uh, we constantly need to make practical judgments as to how to act and how to respond to things. And we do that on the basis of probabilities. Um, so, so if the, the science is telling us it's 98% likely that climate change is created by humans, it's probably much higher than that actually, um, then um, I think we can confidently respond to that and, and um, try and do something about it. It's, yeah, so, and where the middle way also applies there is that uh, it's the denialists who are negatively absolutizing that 1% of doubt and turning it into a totality in those cases and saying, oh, we should reject the science because it's not totally true. Um, and in, in, from the middle way point of view, that's the whole point. You know? um, because people are admitting that we don't have the whole truth and working with that, that should actually give us more confidence in them, not less. Um, and uh, yeah. so I have confidence in science to the extent that I perceive science as working provisionally and being willing to revise its views. Um, so that, so that overwhelming proportion of climate scientists uh, you know, who are looking at the evidence and saying, yes, this is what's happening. Um, you know, they, they have my confidence because it seems to me, yes, they have modified their views over time you know, and, and they keep reviewing the evidence. Uh, all the, you know, everything I've seen suggests that to me. Um, so I don't just have to take it on their authority, but then you can also make an argument about authority that where somebody has expertise and there's an overwhelming probability that they're correct based from your point of view on that expertise as far as you understand that they have that expertise and have confidence in it uh, then again you should rely on, on what they're saying uh, is that making sense as a yes group? that makes perfect sense and then if it was something like if i was i mean as it happens i have enormous sympathy with extinction rebellion and i think people who participated mm. are heroes but let's say that I was saying, well, actually, that's quite an extreme position. You know, the things that pe people are doing, um, disrupting London or whatever, um, is not the middle way. That's very, that's quite extreme. How would you, from a middle way point of view, justify? Is it is it that the that that's what's required? Is it is it the sort of interrogation process continually that's so important in a sense? Yeah, it is the interrogation process. I mean, it's. I think it's important not to co not to confuse conventional extremes with uh, absolutization, which is the extremes avoided in the, in the middle way. Um, so, so what we conclude is an extreme may not be the same as what many people in society, in some cases, consider an extreme. Because what people consider extremes is often just what not what they're used to, um, or they haven't come to terms with yet. Barry wants to come in here, and I know it probably draws on his own experience of extinction rebellion. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I'd just like to say, like you, Lucy, I, I got arrested in October in the, the London action, but um, I see that, you know, some people might consider that extreme, but I saw that as very much a middle way action in the sense that the middle way is, is what most adequately addresses conditions. And I just feel that, you know, governments around the world are not really addressing the conditions effectively uh, with regard to climate change and occasionally i mean it's the first, it's the it's the only time i've ever been arrested in my life you know but it's uh, i just thought that the action was actually proportionate and you know there, there have been other times in history where you know smaller groups or individuals have had to take action when when perhaps that you know the, the governments are not acting in an integrated way and i think I think that this now is a case in point, I think. Thanks, Barry. I couldn't, I certainly couldn't disagree. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yeah, just on that, I mean, what criteria do you use, um, Barry? I mean, you know, there's a series of judgments you make implicit in your <laughs> statement about 
you know, the justification of direct action. So, you know, what, what, you know, what about the toppling of statues or defacing of public monuments or, you know, everybody who does that would say, yeah, yeah, no, you know, it's absolutely essential to make the, to make the point. And I, I, I'm, I'm at sea. Yeah, yeah. No, that's so, a... what's what, what's the absolute set of, well, maybe not absolute, but what what set of criteria do you apply to decide well, whether something is justified or not? Sure. Yeah. Well, I suppose I try to apply the middle way, and I and I would agree with you with the statues. I think I think I think uh, uh, you know that's um, um, I think that there's a danger where you can flip. You know where you you know when you're fighting against an absolute thing, you can you can flip and also take an absolute position. And I think uh, there's a you know a, a danger of just missing out on history to an extent with the. Uh, so I'd agree with you there that that's that. But I suppose with with the the climate change. With 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 getting arrested, I mean, uh, back to what Robert was saying, it's about the balance of prob probabilities, really. That's what I, I uh, it, it seemed to me that the overwhelming, yeah, it just seemed, um, it seems that it, on the balance of probabilities, um, um, you know, that science seems to be telling us that we've only got a, a matter of, months or you know most a couple of years to actually a few years to actually turn turn this around and all the evidence that i've read and heard in books on the television um you know admittedly from my my own echo chamber i but i do you know try to recognize error and so uh, uh you know and we've had various discussions ourselves haven't we so i mean i i tr do try to see other sides uh, of the argument but um to me uh and again um, also i have lots of friends who who um who i feel you know have have um balanced views on this well not all of them but but uh, uh listening to a wide range of people and taking in as many sources as possible i made a provisional judgment to to get arrested now I'm not saying I will do that again, but it just felt right at the time. And it was also confirmed in many ways when I was at the, the station, the police, a couple of police police officers actually came up to me and, and thanked me. Um, and that, you know, it, so there was, there was, there was various evidence uh, that was, you know, seemed to indicate that what I'd done was proportionate, but, um, but I welcome your question. You know, I mean, uh, I would, I would. I'd be interested to know why. Uh, are you at sea, or are you actually? Do you think you know doing something like that actually, uh, you know, is uh, is pejorative to the to the the whole thing? Well, I don't. I don't want to focus it on you, Barry, or on that particular issue. It's more about how you, you know. In any situation, you are, you arrive at a set of criteria. Because it, it kind of sounds like, well, as long as I've thought about it a lot, then it's kind of okay and it fits in with the middle way. No, it's, it's more specific than that. And I think the, the, the thing is, the method basically is to identify absolutes, yeah, if there are any absolutes present, and avoid them, and then work on the balance of the evidence. Yeah, and, uh, and the, um, we'll see the values come into that in relation to your experience of those values. Um, so I think if you, for example, if you're making a decision like that to do something which might be quite extreme in, in uh, conventional terms, like getting arrested, um, and you've worked through it and you've uh, interrogated really whether, interrogated yourself as to ask whether there are any absolute assumptions involved there. You know, have you just, for example, signed up to Extinction Rebellion because of faith in some one individual person who you follow completely or... Uh, have you adopted any dogmas about the earth or whatever? Um, or are you, are you basing on the weight of evidence? Yeah. And if you're basing it on the weight of evidence, then you're following the middle way, even though you may come to a quite different position in the end from somebody else, because you're starting from where you start, modifying your position by uh, avoiding the, the absolute extremes. 
Um, so the middle way will not provide you with an absolute answer, uh, a universal oh. answer. It would just provide you with a way of navigating so as to avoid specific sorts of errors in the decision making that you make. Yeah. yeah. Could, could I just say just one final thing that 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 was very much the process I feel I, I went through, although Robert articulated a lot better than me. But and, and it's I would also like to say that, you know, I've had it's not that I haven't had doubts prior to it and after it as well. And 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 uh, it's created a considerable amount of conflict with certain friends and family. It's not it's not been an easy process. Um, so, but, and that's been, even though it's been painful at times, that's also been helpful, you know, so it's made me constantly question um, my actions and my participation with XR. So it's, it's not a particularly comfortable place, uh, but, uh, but neither is the middle way always a comfortable place. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's almost, almost seems to tell me that the, 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 set, the, the feeling of unrest that I feel that, that, that um, I'm in the right area. Okay, I think we're probably out of time there for, for general questions, but you can always continue with that in your groups if that's uh, what's of interest. Um, 